Audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. There is much pain and much suffering. They give Jesus no food, no water. His skin is sensitive to touch. He will start losing blood. He's extremely weak. He's dehydrated. And so now Jesus is led like a lamb to the slaughter. He knows now that this is the will of God, and he's going to have a resolve to carry it out. Today. 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 Today with Jeff Fines, pastor, apologist, and Bible teacher. Hello and welcome to Today with Jeff Vines. Today we hear about Jesus on the way to the cross, what happened to Him, who spoke to Him, and what the encounters with those who wanted Him killed really meant. Let's continue with Pastor Jeff. I want to tell you a story this morning as we gather together. and It's a hard story. It's the greatest story ever told. It's had the greatest impact on the lives of hundreds of thousands of people for almost 2,000 years. It's a difficult one because it starts with Jesus in the garden, and he's had a great ministry. He's shown nothing but compassion to everybody that he's come across. Blind people have began to see, lame have began to walk, the paralytics have taken their mat up and began to walk. And where a lot of religious people felt that he should have shown a lot more judgment, a lot more ridicule. He instead gave an enormous amount of grace and forgiveness. But now we find Jesus, and I've spent my life trying to understand all of this and all its details. But we find him in a garden now where he's praying, and he actually prays to his father. He says, God, if it be your will, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. It's intriguing. It's also difficult because He's been saying for three and a half years that this is the very reason he came into the world. And now he's asking his father if there's somehow we can change the plan. Is there a plan B in all this? And we read in the, in the Bible, in Luke's account, who's a first-rate historian, that Jesus began to sweat drops of blood. And before you think that's the things legends are made of, that's an actual medical condition called hematidrosis. It's where blood seeps into the sweat glands and the perspiration. So that literally, if you were watching, the sweat is mingled with blood. Physicians tell us that when that happens for the next 24 to 48 hours, your skin is incredibly sensitive to touch. That if anybody just touches you or squeezes you or presses up against your skin, it's enormously painful. And so Jesus, even after he's strengthened by the angels, still faces this kind of anxiety. And I think about, wait a minute, Jesus, you're going to tell us through the apostle Paul later that we should be anxious for nothing, yet you're anxious. And I began to think, is it possible that in that moment, God withdraws, or maybe, I don't know how to put it in theological terms, but maybe, just maybe, Jesus feels his humanity more there then than ever before. Because he's been through Jerusalem and through the streets of Rome hundreds of times. He has seen thousands of crucifixions exhibited and carried out by the Romans. He knows the torture that awaits. And so in his humanity, he's afraid. He goes out because he wants somebody to encourage him. And he finds his disciples sleeping. And he says, guys, can't you stay awake just for a few moments, just for a little while? I need you. I need people with skin on to help me go through this. You've been with me. I need you. And about that time, Judas, one of the 12, walks up and kisses him. And Jesus says, you betray the Son of Man with a kiss, with an act of love? And so the religious leaders, the leaders of the Sanhedrin come and they bind Jesus. Luke and Matthew both in their accounts tell us that on the way to the trial, They beat Jesus repeatedly. First, they talk about an open hand, a slap, and then a close, a clenched fist, and then the palm of their hands. And then they they put a blindfold over him. And then they blindfold him. They say, tell us, prophesy. Who is it that hit you? You're the Christ? Tell us. And part of me wonders, why didn't Jesus just tell them? Why didn't Jesus say, okay, that was you, Malchus, and that was you, and now you're going to be next? That would have really wowed them. 
But in this whole thing, Jesus shows us that the sin is not in being anxious. The sin is how you respond to the anxiety. And so now Jesus, knowing the will of his Father, is led like a lamb to the slaughter. He does not open his mouth. He's not in the position now where he's going to defend himself. He knows now that this is the will of God and he's going to have a resolve to carry it out. But make no mistake, just because he has this resolve in his humanity, he's anxious, he's afraid, he knows about the blood that's gonna be shed, it's gonna be his own. He's got this incredible physical condition now where he's sensitive to touch because of the anxiety. They strike him on his face and on his head and on his back with open palm, with clenched fists. They slap him in the face. They spit on him, Matthew tells us. And then they get him to the trial. And as he's waited outside and he's bound, ready to go in to the chief priest, over in the corner, there's his best friend, Peter, now, who's part of the inner circle. And Peter denies that he even knew Jesus three times. The third time, he's so aggressive in his denial that he actually curses. And he says, man, I tell you, I didn't know who this guy was. I, I had nothing to do with this Galilean. Jesus and Peter, they catch a, a glimpse of one another. And Peter goes out and he weeps bitterly. Jesus goes into the trial now, having been abandoned by everybody that should have been there when he needed them the most because Jesus was always there for them. He goes into the trial. The chief priests are furious. They want to kill him. They ask him, are you the son of God? He says, it is as you say. Other than that, he keeps quiet. And I read the account and I wonder, why do you want to kill a man? Why, do you, why would you want to kill a man who is filled with compassion, who has done nothing but three and a half years of his life, loved people, cared for people, judged no one, given people chance after chance after chance, people that most people would have given up on, that they saw to be unlovable, Jesus loved, that they saw to be beyond repair, Jesus repaired, and they want to kill him. And then I'm reminded, this isn't rocket science. Religious people always want to kill Jesus because religious people think that you earn your right to be in the presence of God by the basis of how good you are. And Jesus came preaching the message that has nothing to do with how good you are because good people don't go to heaven. Only forgiven people do. And the only way you can be forgiven is by this good and gracious God. So the religious leaders hated him because they were making their living out of lording their authority over others and keeping them subjected to this, some kind of moral law that was written on reams and reams of paper to which everyone must obey. And so they want to kill him, but they're frustrated because they can't, because the Romans don't give them the authority to take life. So they march Jesus away. Now think about this. They're beating him along the way and every chance they get, and they blindfold him when they beat him, remember? And in many ways, that's more harsh because the body has this involuntary system to where when you're about to get hit by a punch, you're able to absorb some of it because you see it coming. But when you're blindfolded and it's coming from every area, you're not able to flinch. The natural processes of the body don't take over. And there is much pain and much suffering. They give Jesus no food, no water. His skin is sensitive to touch. He will start losing blood. He's extremely weak. He's dehydrated. For 24 hours, he stands before people that he never even met that accused him of things that he didn't do. His friends have left him. He's been betrayed, denied by his best friend. The Sanhedrin want to kill him, but they can't, so they march him up to Pilate. On the way to Pilate, they beat him again, repeatedly strike him with clenched fist, open hand in the palm of their hands. They deliver him to Pilate. Pilate is intrigued by Jesus, finds him interesting, and no reason to kill him. And he tells the Jewish Sanhedrin exactly that, but they're infuriated. They've got a trump card and they know they need to play it. They know that Caesar instructed Pilate to keep peace at all costs in the Galilean and beyond territory. And that he was part of that entire territory. And if he didn't keep peace, he was gonna pay for it with his life to Caesar. So they said, but, but Pilate, this man instructs us not to pay taxes to Caesar. Are you gonna let him get away with that? Of course, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Give to God what belongs to God. What belongs to God, nobody asked. Jesus would have answered everything. Everything you have, your life, everything belongs to him. That didn't work and Pilate wasn't impressed. So they said, but wait a minute. He started riots beginning at Galilee all the way into this territory. 
and he claims to be a king. That's treason against Caesar. Pilate hears those words and he says, wait a minute, did you say he started in Galilee? Is this man a Galilean? Yes, he is. Well, then send him over to Herod because he's tetrarch over that territory. So 2,000 years, we've been passing the buck. He passed it to Herod. Herod is intrigued. He wants to see Jesus. He's heard that he's kind of like a magician and he can do all these magical works. So he can't wait to see Jesus. Jesus comes into his court. Herod says, I've been waiting to see you. Why don't you do one of those cool tricks for me? Perform a miracle, a miraculous sign, and we'll all watch. Jesus is not into that. He bows his head. He says nothing. Now, the King James Version, unfortunately, is the only version that interprets this phrase accurately. The Bible says in Luke's account and Matthew's that at that point, they handed Jesus over to the men of war. These are men associated with Herod's regime. They are trained torturers. They can get information out of you that nobody else can. Jesus is hungry. He's dehydrated. He's had no food or water up to 48 hours now. He's faced two trials that were unjust. And now he's released to Herod's men of war where we don't know exactly how it happens, but we know enough in literary antiquity to know that way would have punished Jesus severely. Even if it's just more blindfolding and beating from left to right, from clenched fist to open hand to the palm of their hand, whatever it was, Jesus, even at this point, is losing a lot of blood. He's incredibly fatigued and probably nearing hypovolemic shock. Hypo from low, vol from volume, emic blood. Low level of blood as he begins to bleed out. Herod is frustrated with Jesus. Doesn't get any more information. Jesus remains silent because he's intent on following the will of his father. They send him back to Pilate. Pilate hears he's, hears he's coming back. He says, what am I going to do with this guy? He comes up with a plan. He thinks it's a good one, but his wife comes to him and says, husband, have nothing to do with this man. I have been haunted in my dreams. Separate yourself. Disassociate yourself as far as you can from this man, Jesus. There can be nothing but bad come up on our house, on our home. The pilot thinks he's too clever. And he goes out to the Jewish nation who continue to cry, crucify him, crucify him. And he says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to release a prisoner. How about Barabbas or Jesus? Barabbas, the Jews would have hated. A known murderer, a killer of their own people. Treason against the nation of Israel. How about Barabbas instead of Jesus? And I'm sure to Pilate's utter shock and horror, they said, no, give us Jesus, crucify him. Pilate knew he had but one decision to make and he makes it. And I wonder as he turns Jesus over to the Romans, because remember now, Romans, they don't know who Jesus is. They're just doing what they're told to do. Luke tells us that Pilate released Jesus to the Roman Praetorian Guard, the cohort, that 600 men, 600 men take Jesus. I think Pilate knew what was going to happen next. He's going to have him scourged, and then he's going to be nailed to a tree. He's going to be crucified. Now, I don't want you to miss what I'm about to do. I want you to make sure you grasp this, and I want you to grapple with it for a very long time. Because Pilate, I'm sure when he caught a glance of Jesus and they looked at each other, as Jesus marches away into the will of the Father, I'm sure Pilate, maybe for the first time, it begins to dawn on him what he had just done in giving over an innocent man to an angry mob. Here's what they did. They would have tied Jesus to a stump in the ground. And in that stump, jutting out about three feet, they take both Jesus' hands and he kneels down on two knees and they tie his arms around this stump that's jutting out of the ground. They take the first whip. In the Bible, it's translated scourging. The word is fragalao, which I'm sorry, and I don't mean to be crass, and it might be somewhat humorous just for a split second, but it's the same word from which we get our English word flagellance because it means open bowel. It was translated that way because when you were scourged, Eusebius, the first century historian, tells us that the veins and sinews and the bowel, bowel was opened to exposure because they would put Jesus onto the ground, tying him to the stump jutting out of the ground. And then the Roman lictor with that whip of these metal balls that, was de that were designed when thrashed upon Jesus' back to provide deep gaping holes into his back and to bruise severely his back. Some of you have read in history where you only received 39 lashes. That's a misnomer. 
The Romans had the freedom to whip you until they were tired of whipping you. And they often got way past 39 lashes. And they would kind of bring that whip down on the body of Jesus. That hard, hard metal would go in his back between the ribs. It would provide these gaping holes. Blood would ooze out, but basically the first whip was just to bruise you, bruise you so badly. Now remember, it's after 24 hours, 48 hours now of hematidrosis where the skin is incredibly sensitive to touch. And so they bring that, that whip on the back of Jesus. After they've done that for a while and the entire back has been bruised, they will untie one hand of Jesus and they will open him up so that his chest and stomach area, so that they are exposed. And then they will bring that same whip even harder down on those areas to have the bruising on the chest and on the abdominal area. After they've done that, and after the ridicule, 600 men, a Praetorian guard surrounding Jesus, they will then take the second whip. The second whip has a longer shaft. The leather strands are about six to eight inches longer than the ones you see here. And they complete themselves in a type of leather socket into which is inserted chips of sharp bone. These bones are designed that when the Roman lictor came back on the back of Jesus, that the bones would stick into the skin and freeze and then extract flesh as it's pulled away. And they bruise him on the back repeatedly. And then on the front, they tie him again. They extract flesh from his back. Then they untie him again. They extract flesh from the front and from the abdominal area. And then through the legs and the back of the legs until literally Jesus' entire bodily makeup becomes that of, it looks like sliced hamburger meat. It's just all torn and ripped and there are deep holes. That's why the first century Stoic Seneca said it would be better to commit suicide than to go through this punishment and encourage people that when you're in prison waiting the scourge, it is best to take your own life. And so Jesus is scourged by the Romans. It would have taken about five to six hours. There would be blood spilled everywhere, but he's still alive. What happens when you're scourged, you do go into hypovolemic shock. Again, hypo, low, vol, volume, emic blood. And then the heart speeds up. It starts trying to pump blood to the places for healing, but there's no blood to be found. And so it, it then converts to the antithesis of that, whereby there is a, a slowing down of the heart rate, almost to a dead stop, not quite. Lightheadedness, fainting, weakness. And then the kidneys themselves stop producing urine so it can maintain the volume that the body has left. And then there's an incredible desire for water, thirst, as if you'd been in the desert for weeks. Jesus is weak. His skin is sensitive to touch still. He is bleeding all over. He's been wounded. There are gaping holes in his flesh. And then the Bible tells us according to the historian, not only Luke, but also to Josephus, who is not a believer, but is a historian of the first century, that they march Jesus over back to the Praetorian guard. And at this point, they begin to blaspheme and treat him mockingly as if he is Caesar. And so they take the crown, the laurel wreath that Caesar would wear in celebration, and they make a crown of thorns consisting of two-inch barbed quills that you find in and around Jerusalem today. They're very sharp on the end and they slam this down on Jesus' head so that these quills go deeper into his skull. Now there's blood on his head and on his face. And then they take a robe that is called a clamus and the robe is heavy. It's a Roman robe, it's purple to mock royalty, but it's very heavy, very scratchy. And so as Jesus' back and his front and his legs are just incredibly sensitive to touch, as the blood is running down and there's these open gaping wounds, then the coat is spread around Jesus and the very fact that that's on his back becomes so painful. And then they take a reed uh, representing this scepter that uh, Caesar would carry around again at festive occasions. And they place a reed in Jesus' hand and then they bow down and they say, hail king of the Jews. And then they stand up each one taking turn. Who knows if 600 or if two or three, who knows really? but they take turns grabbing the reed out of Jesus' hand and blasting it down on his head so that the crown of thorns go deeper into his skull. And then they take Jesus and they give him a patabulum. It is a 200 pound block of wood. And they stretch him out and they tie him on each side to carry this beam for over a mile and a half up to Golgotha. 
where they're going to crucify him. As Jesus is carrying this cross, he's lost so much blood. and You don't find this very often in Roman history. Scourging is called halfway death. Indeed, people do die from it. But Jesus is still alive and he's carrying this cross. But the Romans wanted to keep you alive as long as they possibly could because they wanted the public to hear the screams when they drive those spikes into your hands as a verbal and audio reminder of what happens to you if you violate Rome or if you commit treason against the Romans. And so a Roman guard evidently saw that Jesus was near death and was going to die of all the blood loss. Again, and enter into hypovolemic shock. And so there's a man over, by the way, we don't know much about him. We just know his name is Simon of Cyrene from Northern Africa. And the Roman guard enforces this guy to carry Jesus' cross on his behalf so that Jesus will still be alive when they get to Golgotha. It works. Jesus is still alive. Now, before I explain to you what happened on the cross, I, I want to say two things. Number one, I don't need the Bible to tell me the information I'm giving you now. You know that, right? Roman centurions, the Roman historian Tacitus tells us that Jesus was crucified and scourged under Pontius Pilate. Josephus, the Hebrew historian, tells us the same. Plenty the younger years later in a document writes about the crucifixion of Jesus under Pontius Pilate. This is not a myth or legend we're talking about, folks. This is historical fact as much as Napoleon is historical fact. And so Jesus makes it to Golgotha. They'll lay him down horizontally. They will dislocate both his shoulders. They will pull them out of socket, six to eight inches each on each side. That in itself is so painful on top of everything else. After they've done that, they will take a nail that looks a lot like this. It's not exact. The thickness is similar, but it doesn't count down to this point. It's tapered to a sharp point in the end. The Roman lictor will take this nail and he will place it here, not here. He will place it here so that when it goes in, it will be located just under the tarsal bone. If you nail Jesus to the tree here, as soon as he is hoisted up on the tree, it's going to tear his flesh and he's going to fall off the cross. We know from archaeological digs that you crucify just below the tarsal bone and it crushes the median nerve as it goes in. It's the most painful thing really ever known to man. We call it hitting your funny bone, but in reality, it's not really that funny. And imagine somebody taking a pair of pliers and squeezing right there and just keeping it there because the median nerve is a nerve that runs throughout the body. And when you crush it and remains crushed, the pain is relentless. And they want to hear you scream. And you do as the Roman soldier brings the hammer down five to 10 times until the nail is securely in place. And then he does the other wrist. And then not in the feet, but in the ankles above the bones as he crushes the nerves, the bones, the Indians. And you better believe that Jesus would have cried out in a loud voice. You've been listening to Today with Jeff Vines. Thanks for joining us. Next time, we'll bring you the rest of this message from Pastor Jeff. The Roman historian Tacitus tells us that Jesus was crucified and scourged under Pontius Pilate. Josephus, the Hebrew historian, tells us the same. Plenty the younger years later, in a document, writes about the crucifixion of Jesus under Pontius Pilate. This is not a myth or legend we're talking about, folks. This is historical fact as much as Napoleon is historical fact. You can listen to more messages like this. Just search for Today with Jeff Vines wherever you get your podcasts. You make me wanna dance and sing With every single breath I breathe I will bring this offering You are my wonder You are the wonder Today 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 with Jeff Vines. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.